Northern governors are responsible for insecurity, says Arawa Consultative Forum. And the Nigeria Bar Association says no to planned use of Land Use Act review. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. The Arawa Consultative Forum has blamed northern governors for the high level of insecurity, particularly in the north and uh, the country at large, describing their abandonment of use in their region over time as a time bomb waiting to explode. It also insisted on dialogue and other regional groups such as the Pan-Yoruba Social Cultural and Political Organization, Afenifere, its southeast counterpart, Ohanes Indigo, and the Pan-Niger Delta Forum, Pandev, to enthrone peace in the North and Nigeria in general. Well, joining us to discuss this is Lanri Suraju. He is a political analyst. Chinedua Honda is a retired colonel, and Dennis Amakri is a former DSS deputy director. Thank you very much for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you for having me. All right. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Macri, because, of course, uh, we're talking about the issue of insecurity. And if a group like this is coming out to point fingers at uh, leaders, especially governors uh, in those regions, then, of course, it calls to question the people who work with them, security operatives or security experts. And I'm guessing that uh, many governors in the north part of the country obviously have not just... Um, relied on our normal security agents, but they must have also um, experts who are consultants that help them, uh, who might be helping them to deal with the security issue. But um, when, the, when these kinds of, you know, statements are bandied, what does that say about security uh, and how the governors are uh, dealing with this in their areas? Uh, well, um I am on the side of the Arewa uh, consultative people when they made that statement that the northern governors are to be blamed for this. Because, you see, they have not done much for their people. Um, they have basically thought about everything that is happening in federal government. Uh, you know, the president will do it. Uh, even when it comes to kidnapping, uh, kidnapping is something that happens in their locality. Even local government chairmen, they are non-existent. They are not doing anything. So I believe strongly that, yes, the northern governors have not been able, maybe exception of one or two or three, otherwise the rest. You can find out that if there is no even uh, uh, a problem in your state, then uh, you are not existing. You don't hear anything about governors who are doing something for their people, uh, schools. Alamangeri schools have all been abandoned. The ones that uh, former President Jonathan Oku, they have all been abandoned. They've closed down. So you find the people out there, and these are the root causes of poverty. And of course, uh, these uh, root causes are the problems of insecurity. When we say that these governors, I want to believe that you're talking about successive governors because it's not, it's not, these governors who are in power today have also inherited some of the problems that they're having in their states. For example, um, Zamfara, Borunu, these are states that have always been strongholds of Boko Haram or you know, serious insecurity, for the exception of the states that, that now have to deal with banditry. But a state like Kanu state, uh, Kaduna State and Plateau State, these are states that have always had issues. Either it be riots, it be killings, communal clashes or religious crises. They have had these problems and it's, you know, continued to roll over from government to government. So you're telling me that successive governments across the northern part of the country have just been there receiving their salaries at the end of the month, uh, collecting monies from um, RFMAC every other month, but they're not necessarily doing anything to better the loss of their people. Is this what you're insinuating? That's correct. 
That's correct because um, you find out that. Um, look, let me tell you something. I've worked when I was in service. I've been in some states, and I know that nothing happens in the government until the twenty twenty fifth or so, when the finance man goes to. Uh, Abuja, everybody knows that the finance man has gone to Abuja. And then he will come back with the monthly salary. And then after they pay the people, and then everybody goes back home. Very few, like I said, you find governors who are doing certain things for their people. You know, so when you also do this, no employment, poverty, you know, all kinds of things, these are the root causes of insecurity. Because why are we having insecurity? You know, people that don't have a job, people are just hanging around, you know, and then of course, politics, politicians will come and incite them during the election, they will be giving money and they will come there and make noise and disappear. So, you will find out that the root cause of insecurity, I think, has a lot to do with the performance of governors in the northern states. Hmm. Interesting. Let me go to Colonel Honda, who's joining us uh, live from Port Hackard. Uh, Colonel Honda, you have been a soldier, a colonel in the army, and you fought for several years, and you not just fought in Nigeria, you have gone for peacekeeping missions outside Nigeria. Um, but what we are facing today in the country in terms of banditry, Boko Haram, and every other agitation from every part of the country, uh, the Northerners, uh, the Arawa Consultative Forum at this point, is pointing fingers to their governors. Now, one of the notable things that we've seen in this um, era of banditry and kidnapping is that the education is under siege, it's under attack. The schools are the targets of these bandits. And, and we know that education is the bedrock of every country or every nation. And if education is attacked, it means that the future of those areas are also, um, you know, uh, one way or the other, under attack. Um, why do you think that education is targeted? Uh, as a man who's been in the field, you know, dealing with issues of peacekeeping or even, um, you know, war? Well, it is very clear and obvious that uh, the northern states of northwest, north central, are the ones mostly involved in this banditry act, abduction of students, and some other social vices. First of all, you check the government of Niger, the government of Kaduna State in the North Central, then the government of Zamfara, of North, and government of Kasina and Sokoto. Those are the areas they have abducted students, they have uh, kidnapped a whole, sort of, whole lot of uh, uh, people and uh, Islamia students and boarding houses and university students. Now, when you check all those things, you find out that the government is more or less encouraging them. And they mean? have bourgeoisie compradors that are working with them, working in tandem with them for them to pay high cost of money. I'm sorry, I don't understand. How do you in, mean the government uh, is encouraging them? How do you mean the government is encouraging them? I don't understand. You say? You said the government seems to be encouraging them. How so? Yes, because of payment of, of, of uh, 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 ransom to the bandits. Because what the Kaduna state government has done is to make sure that they don't pay ransom and they didn't pay. Even the Greenfield students release was paid for and later they were caught. But those of the government of North uh, Niger, Kasina, Zamfara have been paying ransom to them and these people come back and rearrest or abduct students. So what, so should, what, what, that what should the parents be doing? Uh, Colonel Wanda, put yourself in the shoes of the parents, and I'm not in any way saying that it's okay to 
you know, uh, continue to fund. I'm not saying that it's okay to continue to fund terrorism because paying ransom one way or the other means that we're funding terrorism. But um, if you put yourself in the shoes of the parents of these students who've been abducted and, and the fact that maybe security agencies have not been up to uh, par when it comes to dealing with this issue, because we all we keep hearing is that the, the army doesn't know where the bandits are. But then we see a Sheikh Gumi always going to see these bandits accompanied by security operatives. So if you were in the shoes of the parents of these people, would you sit down and, and, and fold your arms hoping that government will not negotiate and your children will be free? You can't tell me that the, uh, the, the, the army or the security agencies don't know where they are. Well, these people are seen, most of the governors, like the Matawale, the governor of uh, Zamfara, the governor of uh, Katsina, they confess that most of these bandits come to the markets openly hanging rifles on their shoulders and buying goods and going, cutting it back to the people. So, and from the recent talks by uh, uh, Sheikh Abubakar Gumi, he said that he goes to their uh, locations, to the forest, with armed policemen and armed security or military operatives. So these people know their whereabouts, their location and everything. So you can't tell me that. So, but, and so the question is, why, why is collaborative. it... So, yeah, okay, Sheikh Gumi has also come out to say that, that there is a collaborative effort within, between the army and these bandits. Of course, the army has come to say that that's wrong, uh, and of course, that, you know, it's fake news. But the question on everybody's lips, and I'm guessing that that's what everybody's thinking right now, why is it so difficult to fish out these bandits? And then they keep coming day after day. It's become... A free for all. They keep coming back to these schools to keep abducting, knowing that ransoms will be paid. So, if the army says they don't know where these people are, or they know where the people are, why are they continuously operating and taking more and more people? And they don't take just two people; they take three hundred sometimes, a hundred plus. So, really, are we the ones that are being fooled here, or is there something else at play that we all really don't understand? Well, you, you, you may ask me that question also, because we, we may not know how collaborative they are with the higher esteem. And I know that. Look, these people are working in tandem with the government agencies, the Comprador Bujazis, and other agencies that are siding them to work out because they know their location, they can attack. They can't attack the place. So what are we talking about? Hmm. And whether we like it or not, the federal government of Nigeria, eyes are on them. They are watching the whole world. The whole, whole world is watching them to see what they will do. They don't want to end this issue because they are busy cutting away money in millions of dollars. Hmm. That's a very hefty allegation, but I'm going to go to Larry uh, Suraju now. Um, Larry, these young people are saying that they have been abandoned. They have been forgotten. All the promises the government have made to them, none of them have been kept. So um, unemployment is at its highest. Um, you know, the cost of living is rising high. These young people, of course, are idle, and it's necessary that they might just become the devil's workshop. Uh, as as, a, as a, a Nigerian, as a citizen, and as someone who's analyzing this space of the politics that we are discussing this evening, um, and from what you've heard from the two gentlemen, uh, where, do we, where do we really go from here? Because we seem to be going around in circles and not really making headway. Yeah, thank you, actually, Marian. And I think it is um, very important that we understand where we're coming from before we start talking about where we're going. Um, th this is a situation where you can barely point at any serious states in the north. And that is not just in the north. It is also the same thing in some of the southeast. It's the same thing in the south-south. It is also the same thing in the southwest. Uh, that governments are not actually providing a living environment for businesses to thrive or even for you to start business, um, new businesses, except for individual efforts. Uh, so employment generation is reduced to political patronage. So where they pick on some of these young people um, give them some token, like you have with the 
social intervention program that is just a kind of palliative, uh, but it's not really sustainable. It, it is not something that you want to affect, you know, any major shift uh, that would come in, in terms of assuaging the rate and the level of poverty that you have uh, around, uh, around the country. Um, it, it is not just like you said, uh, it is not something that is starting now. It is something that has been there, unfortunately, even since the advent of uh, the democratic dispensation. Uh, and it would be uh, very unfortunate if people would only limit this to uh, the mm. current government. That, that is when it becomes political. And that is when we are actually looking at the solution to the problem. Uh, it, it is something that has really been endemic. And that is why, very sadly so, uh, you can see that many of the northern governors are usually charged to court, you know, um, by either ESCC or ICPC after they leave office. So it means many of the governors uh, in, in those states have only just been in government many times or, or to steal or divert or mismanage the resources that are located to many of the states. So what that Ewa Consultative Forum is saying it is just actually naming uh, and rather shaming for now uh, some of those that were mentioned. But this has been uh, an endemic you know, issue, uh, a challenge that has been there over time uh, that people have not been paying attention to. And it was inevitable uh, for us to have the state and the state of insecurity uh, across the country because security is not just about providing gadgets uh, and just gathering intelligence. If you have a system that is heavily invested uh, with the foundation uh, for insecurity. There's no amount of equipment that you're going to purchase uh, or intelligence that you want to gather. You will still be dealing uh, with criminals, even in terms of those that you'll be supplying information to, even in the security forces. So it, it is not a problem that is just within there. And it is not impossible. I don't totally agree that the government is also part of the bandits, uh, but I would agree totally that it is not a problem that is about a federal government alone. And that is where we've been getting it wrong uh, and where the statement of Arewa uh, consultation... But here we are. We're talking important. about states now. We're not talking about the federal government. Yes, the federal government has exactly. its job, but we're talking exactly. about states now. And you said something. I'm sorry. Just hold on. You said something right. about the fact that, yes, this, is, this has been a problem. It has been a problem. But I'm guessing I can almost bet my bottom dollar that every single time a governor mm -hmm. campaigned to get into office... He used the previous government's um, lapses as an excuse to get into office. So why shouldn't we leave this at their doorsteps, knowing that they promised to give the people a better life? But here we are, dealing with insecurity, unemployment, and of course, the fact that people cannot even afford anything um, right now because the cost of living is high. Um, our farmers are unable to go to their farms because it's unsafe. So really, a potpourri of issues, but then the problem still has to lie at the feet of our governors. So can we really put it past them? If they are occupying office and they made promises to, before they occupied that office, why can't we continue to point fingers at them and not look back because they're the ones who are right in front of us? Why? No, you're totally correct. And that's the point that I was driving towards. Uh, you've assisted me in just making the conclusions. Uh, we need to start asking them questions. We need to start collating how much goes to the states. And then we start asking questions. What happened to the local government funds? What happened to the state and federal allocation to the states? What happened to the security votes that they collect? How many investments are attracted to the states? How many businesses are also facilitated by the governments at the level of the states? Then we can be looking at, so we've looked at the federal government. We're still looking at the federal government until we go to the local government and the state. Unfortunately, all the states have collapsed, you know, governance at the local government level. So you can't even find any state. And I say that without any fear of contradiction. Any state currently in this country where you can point at a semblance of democracy or good governance at the local government level. Because the governors would appoint the, gov the local government chairman. And that is why you can see them sacking them as whims and capaces. Even when the Supreme Court said they can't do it. But they will do it because they need the fund of the local government, not for the governance purposes, 
But for the purposes of the administration, you can see how they all kicked against it when FI, NFIU said, stop withdrawing local government funds uh, uh, in cash. But they couldn't afford to do that because that is where they need that fund for the purpose. And local government is the close, closest uh, to the grassroots, but it's not been allowed to function uh, by the state government. And, and that is where we need to start taking people to task. We have not just governors, we have House of Assembly members. You even have those parliamentarians in the National Assembly from all these states who would campaign, like you said, on the ground of you know, poverty, uh, lack of education, and the rest of that. They only use it as a mantra to attract an, uh, attention, support, and criticize the outgoing government, but so, not for the purpose of you know, governance or support. And we need to ask that uh, taking them to task on their commitments uh, during campaigns. I, 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 a quick question before I go back to our security men. Um, we need to take them to task, yes. How do we bring them to accountability when there seems to be a loose sleep, uh, or, I, I mean, uh, for, for want of a better word, and I'm using the word gag use, uh, loosely here, there seems to be a gag on the average person who seems to be screaming out loud, on the average person mm. who's... Um, calling for heads to roll, in a sense, uh, because they feel like they have been let down. I mean, we're mm -hmm. seeing all kinds of bills and acts that are being pushed that are not necessary uh, to deal with the issues that we have at hand right now. So again, how do you get these people's attention if every attempt seems to be um, literally shut down? Yeah, I think uh, I will start from you, you and myself, with our constituency where we belong. Uh, so the media is actually playing a very sad, ignoble role when it comes to the issue of the, the governor. So, and that is why you will see them always jumping around uh, for merit awards, almost on annual, the best governor, without any form of defense or any form. Uh, of justification for those awards. And that must stop. Uh, we must stop even celebrating governors that even come into office one year after. That is number one. Number two, it is insufficient uh, to showcase even governors are uh, as ridiculous as celebrating the commissioning of balls, ordinary balls. The same thing with four or five classrooms for schools. We must stop this kind of shenanigans and also hold them. And that is how we bring them to account, just like you said. The other thing that is also very critical is that the civil society must start benchmarking the performances of uh, the governors. So when a governor gets into the office, we need to know what was the state of the schools, of water supplies, of the health facilities on the roads, and then assess them as they progress so that we can see if they are uh, gravitating towards some of their commitments and okay. our expectations, and not until after four years when they would have stolen the money and about to escape. Okay, let me go back to our security men. Let me start with Mr. Macri. Um, from all of the analysis that we've done tonight, it makes it seem like your job might be a lot more difficult than we think it is. Uh, it, I mean, it's easy for us to have a conversation with security persons and say, why is this and that not done? But if the fundamentals are not addressed, then it makes your job a bit more difficult. Now, there are questions. We're not even trying to put it past security operatives that, you know, there are no questions to be asked. There are questions of welfare, questions of equip, equipping men uh, and, and the soldiers that are, you know, fighting this war, this, you know, irregular warfare. But then going forward, if you were to advise governors, because... When we talk about governors, the first thing that comes to mind is security bills. But it goes beyond that, doesn't it? Of course, it goes beyond the security votes. It goes to governance itself. Because you remember, there are many, many governors uh, that will say, oh, we want state police because uh, I'm the CSO of my state, but I don't have the power. You know, And when I see that, I laugh. Because I, I find it to be very, very um, insincerity. It's, 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 uh, it's very, very sincere for the governors to say that. Because I worked in the state uh, as a director in the state. Every Monday morning, we have a security council meeting. And in that security council meeting, you have the police, you have the DSS, you have the army. You know, you have the Navy, 
like uh, in the, some literal states where they have the Navy people or Air Force. Uh, all the divisional uh, uh, commanders are there. NSCDC, and then they sit down and plan the security strategy for the state. And everybody goes out to do what they have to do. So for the governor to come out and say, what does he want? He wants a force that he can use to pursue his uh, uh, political opponents. That is wrong, because these people are there for him to use, and it will be so insincere of him to say that, you know, he cannot use them. So for all other political uh, problems that need security intervention, he, they are at his disposal to use, and they will go ahead. If they disagree, then remember that he must have brought politics into it. He must have brought politics into it. But if it is of security nature or criminal nature, the security agencies are at his disposal to use. Uh, not to talk of the billions of uh, uh, Naira that he claims as, uh, uh, what do you call it, security vote. And I think it's high time they start auditing those bodies. <laughs> because I think he's just going into um, a bottomless pit. <laughs> I, I mean, that's a whole kettle of fish on its own. It's a conversation that we can have for an hour or another day. But let me finally go to Colonel Honda. Colonel Honda, you've heard everything that we've talked about going forward. Um, and it, it also it puts the army in a precarious situation where one minute we're seeing them, you know, accompanying a, a Sheikh Gumi to the destination. And then the next minute, the army is saying they do not know where the bandits are. The, the job of the army is cut out for them. We know that. But how can we win this war against banditry and insecurity in the north with the help of the army and collaborations with governments uh, taking up, um, you know, politics from it? There's no hiding the fact from what uh, Gumi said that Gumi was once a former soldier, a captain in the army medical, and uh, he can't be telling lies that the army accompanied him and the policemen to the location of these bandits. He can't be telling lies. He won't say they are unknown soldiers or unknown uh, policemen or known whichever uh, operative. He has said it, and he said it, but all I think the government can do is to investigate f fully, investigate fully, and make sure that they authenticate those that went and those, because it, it is someone to a whole of uh, uh, jokes that the army knows their location and nothing yet has been done. It's just laughable that our military, our military can accompany a high-class uh, government agent or non-government agent to go and find out what is happening in the dissonance today. They are, uh, they, they are either not known their addition, they don't know their locations, and nothing has been done, and no arrest has been made, and which means the government is playing to the gallery. They know those that are really involved in this thing. Okay. Well, um, Larry Shiraju is a political analyst, Dennis Amakri, a uh, former DSS deputy director, and Colonel Honda is a former uh, colonel in the army. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll take a short break, and when we return, the federal government has announced plans uh, to review the Land Use Act, and some actually disagree. We'll get to know when we come back.